I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about how does neurofeedback work. Neurofeedback is a component of biofeedback. Biofeedback is where uh, measure, measurements are taken of the body for the autonomic nervous system, which is usually temperature or blood pressure or pulse or any type of measurement of a system of the body that we don't control consciously. Once we learn to measure it, we can start to learn to control it consciously in a sense, and it takes a little while to do that. Um, when we measure brain waves, specifically brain waves coming out of the brain, that's called neurofeedback and it's a form of biofeedback. So neurofeedback involves measuring brain waves and training an individual to learn how to change their brain waves. Now, what do we try to change them to? We try to change them to something that's more ideal. Now, right now, one of the big conventions of what's more ideal is called Z-scores. We would think that if we have a database of, of hundreds of, or even over a thousand of, of normal people uh, your age and gender, it'd be nice to be able to find out what their brain waves are. And if we could figure out that they were all very healthy, we'd like to have your brain waves match theirs, or, or at least closely match theirs, especially at rest in the states of eyes closed and the state of eyes open, awake, sitting up in a chair and not falling asleep and not really doing anything. So essentially we're, we're measuring how does the brain relax, how does the brain idle. That's, um, that's current theory in neurofeedback. Now there are certainly ways to do neurofeedback that might involve active tasks, and that's for another topic. But today, the convention in neurofeedback is neurofeedback at rest with the brain resting. The, um, the question is asked a lot, how does neurofeedback actually work? What are we doing? Well, first of all, we're measuring the brain waves. Second of all, we're comparing them to a database of normal in a lot of cases. Not always. Some people, some therapists just um, compare to an absolute number and they, they, they go up or down of amplitude or up or down in, in um, coherence. We've spent others, other uh, classes talking about amplitude and coherence. Amplitude, very briefly, is the power, the voltage of a brain wave. And um, the frequency of a brain wave is, the, is how fast it vibrates, um, whether it's a very fast wave or a very slow wave. And then uh, coherence is how one region of the brain communicates with another region of the brain if there's too much crosstalk or if there's too little crosstalk. So getting back to how does neurofeedback work, the general concept of neurofeedback is um, you're training your brain to do something different than what it's doing now. So since we don't consciously know how to change our brain waves, we're kind of waiting until the brain randomly tries something and then the feedback says, ooh, that's the right direction. The, the really cool thing about neurofeedback is neurofeedback uses light and sound right now. Light and sound and sometimes vibration. So since humans and animals, or at least mammals, tend to prefer um, something to nothing, they get a little bit of a dopamine reward released in their frontal lobes from um, part of their, their midbrain. So your midbrain releases this, this little reward cascade of dopamine whenever you hear something pretty or, or, or fun or, or novel or when you see something that's flashing lights or interesting or appealing, anything that's novel or new or interesting and not threatening makes us produce dopamine. Just a tiny bit. And that dopamine travels from uh, the ventral tegmentum, the, the upper part of the brainstem, um, uh, the, the midbrain actually, called the mesencephalon, forward into the frontal lobes and, and, and diffuses the whole frontal lobes. Um, in addition, it hits first on its way there an area called the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is a reward area that is responsible for um, giving us a sense of reward when we do something right. And every day something right might be like eating a meal or completing a task. These are, these are um, events that produce dopamine and allow us to feel a sense of goodness and a sense of achievement and a sense of completion, and they drive us to complete tasks and want to do the next task. Now there's a lot more to talk about with dopamine, but the general idea is this area can be overdriven in, um, in cases of addiction, where people are um, really driven to, to satisfy a massive addiction. But in, in healthy, normal people, um, this region of brainstem to nucleus accumbens to the frontal lobe is the reward cascade using the neurotransmitter dopamine. And so, if you have um, a little bit of a, of a sparkle on the screen uh, from, from nothing, or if you have a couple of sounds that appear in your ears from, from silence, um, and they occur within half a, half a second, which is 500 milliseconds, then the timing is right for the brain to associate 
the event that, that occurred in the brain with the reward that occurred outside. So it has to occur in half a second, it has to occur in 500 milliseconds, otherwise the brain misses it and doesn't really tie them together. So as you're sitting there, the first time you do neurofeedback with the electrodes or the full cap on your head, um, your brain doesn't really know what it's doing, it's just emitting waves. And if it happens to emit waves that are close to the goal that we want, if we've programmed the computer properly, then um, what'll happen is there'll be a reward. And so your brain will go, ooh, there's a reward. I must have done something interesting. I must have done something right. I want to do that again because I want the reward again. So the novelty of this new thing appearing on the screen, this new, um, this new visual um, um, sparkles or, or whatever happens on the game, it could be a video game, it could be the playing of a movie, it could be some kind of flashing lights or colors. It could be really uh, even waves on the screen. It could be your actual brain and you're looking for your brain to change colors from uh, an angry red color of, of too much um, amplitude down to a nice placid green. And you're taught that that's your reward. So there's all types of rewards that are visual. And then of course, there's the auditory rewards. When your eyes are closed, you can't see anything. And so your auditory rewards would be sounds that, that play. And those are, those are usually pleasant tones that play either high or low, sound, low frequencies. And, um, and they, they play in a, in a non-discordant tone, so they're not unpleasant. And so they tend to be a feeling of reward. They generate a feeling of reward. So that would make the person produce a little tiny bit of dopamine if it's coincided with the event. So your brain learns and associates, well, gosh, I, 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 I randomly changed this brain wave in this area to, to this, and I got a reward, so let me try it again. So what your brain will do is it'll try it again and again and again and again. And every time, uh, a lot of these systems are programmed so that um, once you get uh, an, an electrode about 2% closer to your goal that you've programmed, you get a reward. So the brain starts to quickly learn that if I can sustain a uh, brainwave toward what I want, I'm gonna get my reward. I'm gonna get my, my, my flashing light or I'm gonna get my sound or I'm gonna get both. And so then uh, that, that gives us this association, this, this dopamine. So a lot of people ask the question, what kind of training is this? Is this, is this classical condition, conditioning? Is this operant conditioning? Well, it's some of both. Um, classical conditioning tries to associate an unconditioned stimulus with, with something that's conditioned. So, for example, an unconditioned stimulus that really, really makes us do something um, pleasant uh, or experience something pleasant, rather, would be like the smell of food. So if we, um, if we look at Pavlov's dogs, if we smell food, we're going to have salivation and we're going to have, you know, um, some activity of our, of our brain and our salivation. If we hear a bell ring, we're not going to salivate or we're not going to react, we're not going to do something with our brain. Um, that is desired by whomever, because there's no, there's nothing, there's no salience, there's nothing important to the ring of that bell. But if we can associate the ringing of the bell with the smell of the food and the presentation of the food, then at some point we can actually present the bell without the food and produce the salivation. So that's classical conditioning, is you take something that really isn't a trigger and you pair it with something that is a trigger, and if you do it long enough and then take away the real actual trigger, the fake trigger becomes salient, it becomes important, it becomes, it becomes now um, a tied to uh, something real that triggers pathways in our brain. Well, we know it's classical conditioning because lights and sound do produce something real in the brain, which is a reward, just like the smell of food. The smell of food produces changes in our brain genetically, whether we like it or not, and flashing lights and sounds produce subtle changes in our brain from silence compared to silence. Um, anyway, they, they produce this dopamine reward, they produce a an, an, uh, um, firing of the autonomic nervous system, uh, an increase of arousal, and, and an increase of epinephrine, an increase of dopamine, and an increase of this whole reward cascade. It, it will change insulin levels, it'll change insulin resistance, all of those factors essentially wake us up and say something's happening versus something's not happening. So, in a way, sound and light, in, compared to the absence of sound and light, are actually unconditioned stimuli because they alone by themselves have some semblance of activation in our brain. They, 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 they prod us to make this dopamine. So they're a lot like food. Uh, they're a lot like um, natural stimuli that are real. So when we go back to operant conditioning, operant conditioning is the idea that we can, um, we can give someone a positive or a negative reinforcement, which is to say we either do something to them or we take something away and we can have a reward or a punishment. So that really sets up four quadrants of, of options that we could do with a person. But generally with neurofeedback, we're giving them a reward 
and we're giving them a, a reward that's that's positive and and we're um um, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to give them an association so that when their brain does the right thing, which we've defined as getting closer to normal, getting closer to the Z score, getting closer to what lots of other people have, we, um, we get a, we, we give them a reward. So, um, the operant conditioning can also go the other way. You could give someone a, you could set someone up so that, um, instead of, of their brain producing the right waves and they get a sound and a light as a reward. We could create it so they watch a movie, and their steady state is watching their favorite movie, um, maybe maybe a movie on a, a online player or or a recording, and they're watching their favorite movie or their favorite TV show. And whenever they don't do what is right for their brain waves, they get a, kind of a punishment where their um, their screen is darkened. And so that idea of a dimmer is a very useful concept where a person learns how to create the right brain waves by getting this little mild frustration. They see their video and they see their video turn dark and they get frustrated and their brain searches to try to do something new and try a new solution. It emits different brain waves and likely very short, in very short order, their brain will produce the brain waves that are desired and the reward will come as, as a brightening of the screen so they can actually see the actors and see the scene that they're looking for instead of it being darkened. So that's an example of a, um, uh, uh, punishment essentially, where um, where what they're doing to you is they're they're depriving you of a signal, and so your screen gets dark, you get frustrated, your brain tries different stuff until your screen comes back, and then you can see your show again. So uh, this works very well in children, it works very well in adults, it works well in all kinds of people, and you just have to try and find out what's better for each person. Some people respond to that kind of thing because they're motivated, they want to see the show, and their brains learn quickly. Now remember, once again, if this darkening doesn't happen within half a second or 500 milliseconds of the actual brain event, the brain doesn't associate what they did with a failure. And likewise, if the machine isn't fast enough to, to activate and lighten up the screen and show and reveal the, the show of the movie in, uh, within half a second of the, of the person correcting their brainwave, then they won't get the reward. They won't associate the change, the positive change with, with, um, with reward. So the difficulty is when a person trains this way, they're really doing a couple of kinds of operant conditioning. Every time they blacken the screen, they're getting, they're getting an inhibition or they're, they're, they're getting a with, withholding of their wonderful stimulus. And then when the scene changes from, from black to, to light and the, and the um, individual, the subject sees their show again, now they're getting a reward. So on both sides, you get, you get quite, a, quite a change in reward, whether you're going from dark to light or light to dark. So that dimmer idea of dimming a video to train neurofeedback really, really works. Now, no electricity is going into the patient. There is no brain waves going into the patient. We're not trying to shove stuff into their head with the cap. All we're doing is receiving the information from their brain, running it through a computer, comparing it to normal, normal scores, and rewarding them when they get closer to normal or closer to ideal or whatever our goal is with these, these methods of audio and visual training. So uh, neurofeedback works by stimulating bits of dopamine in tiny amounts over time. It works by association, by, by tying together events within half a second or 500 milliseconds. And it works using various forms of operant and classical conditioning.